Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's a great pleasure to have uh, Barak uh, Parmutter here. Um, he's a professor at the Hamilton Institute uh, at Maynooth in uh, Ireland. Um, he has a broad spectrum of interests ranging from the, um, automatic differentiation, which is the topic here, programming languages, how the brain works, source separation in earlier days, um, and uh, a number of other topics. But today, the topic will be automatic differentiation. Please. Thanks. Yeah, so, of course, the reason I'm really interested in automatic differentiation, oh, I'm supposed to turn this on. Okay. The, the reason that I'm interested in automatic differentiation is because I'm interested in how the brain works and machine learning and stuff like that, and um, the brain seems to embody compositionality in that, you know, as, as animals evolve, their brains get bigger and smaller and they get added hunks and stuff like that, and it all just kind of seems to work. They don't seem to have to completely re-evolve their learning algorithms. So there's some kind of compositional learning going on. And I view automatic differentiation as a, as a laboratory where we can work on how we can do optimization of complicated computational structures uh, and trying to get formalisms in place for that. And so, okay. So let me, um, let me, let me get moving here, right? Uh, let's see. Okay. So this is a revisionist history. So probably people who are into automatic differentiation will be mad after they hear this. But on the other hand, every, everything in automatic differentiation has been reinvented by a bunch of different people. And those who are still alive get really mad if you cite people who are dead for inventing something, even though it was a, you know, 50 years earlier. You can't win, right? OK. So what is automatic differentiation? Well, it's an established tool. It's been around for a very long time, since the dawn of the computer age or even before. And the basic idea is if you have an, a, a function, but not some kind of theoretical mathematical function, but what I guess um, in the 30s and 40s they would have called uh, an effectively defined function. So a function with an effective computational definition. Right? So in other words, a Fortran program. Right? That's what that's supposed to be there, foo.f. So that's a, that's a specification in a formal language that specifies a particular function. And you run it through some AD tool, and it's supposed to give you um, a, another um, effective function, which calculates, maybe it calculates what the original one did, but it also uh, calculates some derivatives that you want to know. Okay. Um, now, we're familiar with this where the language is expressions, right? Simple arithmetic expressions like in, um, in Calculus 101, right? Where uh, we specify functions that way. I mean, we call them expressions, but they're always, they're actually functions of one distinguished variable, right? So it's a, it's, we sort of hide the fact that it's a function there. And we have the rules of calculus for doing that. And so we get closure that way on this particular little language of, uh, of um, derivatives in, in Calculus 101. But the, the closure properties there are not so great because, um, uh, uh, first of all, the language isn't very rich. So it can be, um, if you write things out as an expression, um, instead of, say, a straight line code, the, the expression can be much longer, right? exponentially longer. And also, when you take the derivative of, of an expression, it can blow up exponentially for when, when, when you do it that way. But if we put these things into other languages, like here, like Fortran program or straight line code or something like that, then we get closure not only um, in that we're outputting the same language as the input, but also we can get some complexity properties. So we can have um, complexity guarantees that relate the, uh, the runtime and storage of the output uh, based on the input. And those are usually pretty favorable. Right. So, so that, that makes you happy right, as a, a program. We said it's not a rich enough language. There's a loss of sharing and hence potential blow up. Um, well, there's lots of sharing. There's also things like um, numeric programs often contain loops. 
And there's sort of two kinds of loops. There's loops over the indices of an array that are just shorthand for, um, un, you know, we could conceptually unroll it. But then there's loops until some, something settles down. And that kind of loop would, I mean, you could try to put that into an expression, but then it's not really that kind of expression anymore. It's higher order or something like that. Right? Yeah, we could have a fixed point, a, num a numeric iterate to fixed point operator, which would be much weaker than general recursion. Approximate numeric iterate to fixed point, which is what people really use. But yeah, also um, in code, you often have branches like ifs and control structures and stuff like that. And um, you might object that if you're like on the boundary of an if, maybe things aren't differentiable there. And for the remainder of this talk, I'm not going to worry about that. Okay? If you try to take the derivative of a function in a place where it's not differentiable, I'm sorry, but automatic differentiation will not give you the correct derivative. <laughs> okay? Because such a thing doesn't exist. <laughs> all right, so we're not so. You know, if you turned all this into theorems, you'd have to put all kinds of caveats on about C1 and open regions and stuff like that. And I'm not going to worry about that. Okay? All right. I should say, it's, it's good people ask questions. Please feel free. This is a nice, nice room, right? OK. Um, so, OK, so what derivatives? So, um, so, so first, I'm going to go over to the, to the whiteboard over there and, and try to kind of write, write things using pens, because I find it's a little more effective with this sort of thing. Um, so what are our desiderata? Well, we would like. To, to get um, our input there, right? Our input should be a general purpose programming language. We want efficiency. But what derivatives can we reasonably expect? Well, let's say we have some function and it's defined in some language. Can people see? Okay. Let's say we have, you know, function foo and it's defined like that. And well, what, what sensible derivative, and, and we've got some program to do that, and we want to transform that to also calculate some derivatives. Well, what derivatives could we want? And let's not worry about higher order derivatives. Those are for later. Okay. Well, the first thing you'd think of is, well, let's take the derivative of each output. Write that down. You'd say the, say the Jacobi matrix operator, which j of f at x. This is going to be the Jacobian matrix of f at x. And that's a matrix whose elements are the derivative of the um, the ith component of the output with respect to the jth component of the input evaluated at x. OK. So what's the problem with that? Well, we can look at how big this output is. So that takes a function rn to rm and a point r. And sorry, I'm not going to be curried of people who don't know Curry, right? um, and gives us back um, a matrix of size uh, m by n, right? Well, in general, we'd like to think that we'll be doing this to big, great big complicated programs that would be a hassle to do it manually on, right? So like some, let's say f is an image processing thing where it takes a bunch of images as inputs and spits out an image as its output, and we want it, we want to do some kind of, you know, futzing around relating bits of the output, bits of the input. So, so that's the derivative we want to take. Well, then n and m are both like a million, right? So then this thing's like a million by a million. That's too big, right? You, you can't even store it. So what do we do instead? Well, in general, when you have a great big matrix like that, what's a matrix? It's a linear transform. So when you have a big matrix and you don't want to store it, all you can do is you can treat it as a linear transform and try to interrogate it that way. And that's called treating the matrix as a generalized sparse matrix. And it's, it's called that for historic reasons, right? Um, OK. So if we do that. Does that mean to the function from i and j to? It, well, what we'll have is we won't have that as a matrix. We'll, we'll just have a linear function that we can, we can operate on things. Which will apply to matrices in R n produce. Yeah. Matrices. So let me oh, right. sorry, vectors in R n. Right, exactly. Just so. So let me write that down. So instead we'll have something like F. Okay. And F will take a function um, R n to R m and a point in R n and maybe another point in R n. Okay, and um, 
let me let me put parentheses around there, even though I know they don't really matter, right? Just for um, okay. And it'll spit out, um, say, compare R M. Okay, so what, what is this supposed to do? Well, basically, here's what it's supposed to do. We take f and we apply it to a function g, right? And at a point x, um, x prime. And this is supposed to give us g of x, a pair. It'll give us the, the output, so the original thing, g of x, and also the product of this Jacobian with that thing. So j, g, x, x prime. OK. But, to, but the way this works internally, it should do so without constructing this matrix. Why did you choose that by the right-hand side? Hmm? Sorry? Why did you define f thusly? Oh, well. You just written it down, but you haven't told us why. Yeah, right I, it, I'll, you, you'll see why. But there's favorable complexity properties that come from doing it this way. So basically, what this is asking for is it says, not only do I want to evaluate g at x to get g of x, mm -hmm. but I also want to multiply the Jacobian at that point by some vector. Okay, you're just telling me that's what you will want. Okay, I believe you, well, you will want that. I mean, of course, by using lambda expressions, you know, we, we, we could abstract it to separate those two apart, right? So we could, we could just get this, right, by appropriate machinations, but that would have or um, storage properties. So it wouldn't give us the space efficiency that people want. And these codes are often, you know, involve lots of great big matrices internally. And so you don't want to be leaking storage when you don't have to. Or maybe would it be fair to well, use the Jacobian that way? Well. As opposed to perhaps uh, from N to N. Sure. Well, so we'll have that too, okay? So this is called forward automatic differentiation. And there's also something called reverse automatic differentiation, which fulfills your desiderata of not coupling them. Um, so reverse automatic differentiation works like this. We've got R. Um, so that will take a function from Rn to Rm. And a point in Rn, in the input space. And it'll give us back a point in the output space paired with a function from Rm to Rn, which we could have done here instead, right? If I'd left the x off here, then that would be such a function. Um, and in particular, it'll look like this, Rg at x um, will give us a pair g of x paired with a function that maps, I'll call this um, y bar <coughs> to the Jacobian of g at x transpose times y bar. OK. So that separates them out, but it's no prettier. I mean, maybe you could give some motivation okay. in terms of optimization right. or sensitivity analysis. Yeah. Or something. Right. Okay. So, so, look. so we want to know about derivatives of something, and so the derivatives are on this big matrix, right? That's that, 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 that's that's um, right. That's the business end of things. This 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 Jacobian matrix here, but th that matrix is too big. And when you have a matrix that's too big, what can you do? You can multiply by it. In this case, we'll be able to multiply by that matrix, and we'll be able to multiply by that matrix transpose. Now, what good would that do you? Well, multiplying by that matrix is called a directional derivative. And let me um, draw a picture. Well, actually, I have a slide. If I pooch around here, um, let me see if I can find the right slide here. Um, Right, sorry, I'm, I'm like going to skip to totally ahead here. There. OK. So here, here's our mapping from one space to another. Right? This is the input space. That's the output space. Is this f? Yeah. So this is, f. This is g there or whatever. Yeah, g. right. OK. The, func yeah. the function that we're yes. trying to that, That's the function. And it happens to map this point to that point. But of course, it maps all the points here to somewhere there. Uh -huh. 
and it's nicely differentiable. So um, there's this notion called the directional derivative, and that works like this. So um, in, on, on, on this slide, these are like curved manifolds, but it doesn't really matter. Okay, you can think you can think of these as being you know R n to R m. It's just then this then this tangent thing would look the same, so it'd be hard to distinguish them, right? So. So here, we, we can ask, well, if I do an infinitesimal perturbation in this direction on the input, what perturbation will I get on the output? And that's called a directional derivative. Well, the partial derivatives are just the sort of Cartesian components of that. that right? uh, that's right. You make a little incremental change on x or y or z or whatever. That's right, because the mapping from, from, um, from infinitesimal changes on the input to the output is the Jacobian. Uh -huh, yeah. right? The Jacobian is a representation of that linear mapping. Okay. okay. So, so there we go. Um, oops. All right. So we keep rolling over here then. Um, so, but what, what you can do with that is, well, there's all kinds of uses for that. For, for optimization, say, you could do a line search maybe. You could, you could ask how things are going to change on the output if you make some change in some direction on the input. But actually, the forward's not the most useful one. The reverse one is the useful one because this reverse one, well, one thing that dominates numeric analysis, numeric methods, are, are gradients. Right? Well, so if you're looking for a gradient, then m is equal to 1. Right? And the gradient is just the, the Jacobian, well, the Jacobian transpose, actually, because it's a row vector rather than a column vector, but whatever. Right? It's the same numbers as in the Jacobian. But if we use this forward thing here, that would allow us to calculate efficiently, as I'll show you, as I'll show you soon, the dot product of the, of the gradient with some vector. Well, you know, OK, so the gradient has you know, a million components, and I allow you to compute the dot product of it with something. That's not so great. What you want is the whole gradient, so that you can do optimization. And this would allow you to do that, because this thing transpose, if you just, if you just put a 1 there for this, just a little one element vector um, that has a 1 in it, then this will give you the, uh, the gradient. So that's, that's the idea. Yeah. So is it the same trick in, you introduced in the 94 paper? Uh, um, in terms of the uh, well, I, OK. <laughs> I, I, I introduced it in the typographical sense of that paper. That, that, that in the introduction of that paper, I discussed the technique, but it wasn't actually um, originally my idea. In fact, it goes back to the dawn, as we'll see, of, yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, but I, mean, but, but I like to think it was an context. extremely clear presentation that causes people to think of me, when, which is very nice. But, <laughs> yeah, sorry. To put it brutally, practically, numerical optimization routines either typically either take the Jacobian represented as a sparse matrix mm -hmm. or accept a function called Jacob Malt, which you should supply, which will multiply the Jacobian by a vector. That's right. And it is the job of AT, AD to supply whichever of those is more efficient and more suitable. Right. Well, okay, so that's, this is really skipping ahead, but you are absolutely correct that numeric optimization routines in current systems right now, like if you go pull out some canned Fortran code, it, if, it's a, if it uses a gradient method, it'll have an external function parameter for the function you're trying to optimize and another external function parameter for a Jacobian vector multiplication or maybe for something that, that does, does this business, so it gives you both the both, both evaluates the objective function and gives you a Jacobian vector product, um, or some API for passing in this function here. So this Jacobian transpose, right? The, 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 the gradient calculation routine will be an external um, routine supplied as a parameter to this, to this numeric algorithm. And that sounds very innocuous, but actually, that's terrible for modularity, right? Because the numeric, the optimization routine is exposing the fact that it uses a gradient method. It uses a first order gradient method. If it wanted to do like a Hessian thing, it would have to have this, another, you'd have to change its API. And that's a big mess. And that's one reason that numeric codes and AD in general have been pretty hard to use because um, of this violation of modularity. And so that's one thing that we're trying to do is to make it so that um, a routine, just because a routine does some AD, doesn't, it doesn't have to declare it. Right? It, doesn't have, it doesn't change its API. That can be an, an internal implementation thing. OK. But let me, let me, let me go on here. That, that's for my list of nasties, right? That's supposed to be later. OK. So, so this is forward AD. 
and this is reverse AD, at least the, the API. And so let me describe how they're implemented. And I know a lot of people are familiar with it, so maybe if you are, this will give you a different take on how it works. Um, and yeah. Okay, so the first way you would think of implementing this would be very easy, right? You would say, well, why don't we do this? Um, if I want to calculate this um, Jacobian of g uh, at x times x prime, well, I could just do it like this. Um, that'll be approximately equal to g of x plus h x prime. So where h is a small real number, right? Minus g of x divided by h for some small h, right? OK, so that, that's called numeric differences. People who know numeric analysis will tell me that this should have a minus hx, and that should be 2h there, and that would reduce the error. Well, not much, <laughs> because this is the worst formula in the whole world. It commits both cardinal sins of numeric analysis, right? There's, like, you can take a whole numeric analysis course, and basically the two important things that you learn are you should never add big numbers to small numbers. And you should never subtract two big numbers from two two um, numbers of approximately the same magnitude from each other. Then you should never divide by a very small number. <laughs> oh no, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, yeah that's no. fine. I mean, assuming it's not so small that you run into underflow or something. Well, that's very small. But no, no. Well, it it, 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 it can, no, no, no. The, the problem isn't the division here. The problem is this this that addition is bad, subtraction. and that subtraction is bad. And so you get horribly inaccurate results from that. Well, okay. Another cardinal rule of numeric analysis, which is keep all your stuff around one. <laughs> right. So you should take things which are kind of one-ish, and I put things which are kind of one-ish. It's tough if you want yeah. to differentiate it, you know, 100. Well, 100 is around one-ish. It, it, yeah. it's, like, <laughs> it's, like, it's like 1 E 200, which is not, not one-ish. <laughs> OK, so, well, but let's, let's um, Let's try to do this a little bit differently. Let, let's um, say we want to do something to a program, right? So let me start writing things you could do to a program. Well, if you in, in a calculus class, you might see something like this. You say, well, look, I want to know the derivative of g. Here's another way I can do it. Why don't I calculate x, g of x plus epsilon? OK, for a small epsilon, right? That's, you know, power series, right? So, and. I won't use other notation for g, although you should, right? <laughs> you should write something else because it should be like lifted to the power domain, you know, power series domain, but okay. And so that would be equal to um, g of x plus g prime of x epsilon plus order epsilon squared. Well, okay. So that seems all right. Um, and in the multi dimensional case, this would become the Jacobian here, that, that g, right? Well, sort of. Would it be? No, it doesn't work. There's no dimensional analysis, right? This is a vector that's a matrix. It doesn't work. Okay. Well, oh, that's too bad. Well, so if we're going to have it in the multidimensional case, we'll have to generalize somehow. So how about if we, and also, I don't like the way the right side and the left side are different because it's hard to, when you do program transformation, you want something that can be kind of compositional, right? So like if you're trying to process, say, um, if we want to do this to g of x is f2 of f1 of x, right? Well, if we have machinery around to do this, so even if we can already do this, well, this formula would apply to that inner one, but then the form of the thing on the inside of this f2 doesn't obey this, right? It's not of the right form anymore. So we want to make something more symmetric. OK, so let's generalize this a little bit. So we could write <coughs> plus x prime epsilon. OK, and now it would be OK for this to be a vector and that to be a vector. I thought x was a vector already. Well, it can't be a vector here. And here it has to be a scalar, right? Just because epsilon is a scalar, right? Oh, if you say so. Yeah. But it could have been a vector. Anyway, yeah, it's yeah. probably epsilon. Yeah, yeah, right, right. OK. Um, and so then we'd write, well, that would, our power series expansion would be x plus um, 
g prime of x. This is just this would actually be the Jacobian, right? J g x x prime epsilon plus order epsilon squared. Okay, so now the left side and the right side are looking a little more alike, but it's still um, right. We, we we get this annoying order epsilon squared thing on the in, uh, on an argument to f two that wasn't in the argument to f one. Well, it should have been in the argument to F1, right? That would have solved our problem. So let's, let's modify this some more. So we'll get x plus epsilon plus order epsilon squared. Okay, so a truncated power series. Or, or if, you're, if you're a mathematician, it's a, it's a quotient ring. Okay, so it's quotiented over epsilon squared, whatever. Okay, so then we get the same thing over here. G of x plus... J, G, X, X prime, epsilon plus order epsilon squared. And now it's just a matter of notation to make this so something that we could try to implement, right? So I'm going to take this, and I'm going to say, well, this is um, a dual number. So people here should know what a dual number is, because it comes because Clifford invented dual numbers in 18-whatever. His paper on the construction of the biquaternion. Right, so if it happened that somebody here didn't know what a dual number was, uh, which I will explain, which I will explain. <laughs> yes, no. <laughs> um, so, so I will use as notation for this. I will just write it um, like this: x with a little triangle, x prime. Okay, that's just my notation for that little truncated power series. For well, this, um, epsilon is just a formal parameter right, because it's a formal power series. So um, this is this, so this is a constructor for um, a, a power series. And I mean that's a function which takes epsilon as an argument. Yeah. So implicitly, epsilon is just sort of free somehow. Yeah. It's a parameter for the whole thing. Well, okay. Think of it. So you should think of it more like I'm. Um, um, so in the construction of dual numbers, Clifford did it like this. He said. Um, We'll consider the following arithmetic x plus x prime epsilon, where x, is, x and x prime are real. And it has the property that epsilon um, is not equal to 0, but epsilon squared is equal to 0. And as notation, this is just like complex numbers, right? x plus y i, right? Right, so where you know we represent a complex number um, where, where, where you know i is not equal to zero. In fact, i squared equals minus one. So okay, um, so this doesn't form a division ring, whereas that does. But you know it's still, and so we, when we represent a complex number inside a computer, we represent it you know as with a constructor, right, as, a, as an argon pair like that. And so we'll represent this as a pair too. And this is just a constructor for such a pair. Okay. Yeah, and then epsilon is just one notation for such a pair, and this is a different notation for it. Okay, so now we have we have this g of this is equal to um, well, this is sort of g lifted to to these dual numbers. So I'll put an arrow on it just to distinguish. Is equal to g of x plus this business. Uh, but there's not a plus there, and there's no epsilon there. Instead, we have a, a triangle thing. Okay. All right. So now this solves our problem here, right? Because um, in order to lift g, we could just lift f2 and lift f1 to operate on these dual numbers. Or, you know, if this is multidimensional, then this becomes a vector of dual numbers, right? And this all just works, right? So. In, in, in particular, we get our property from this f thing here, that f of, say, um, f1 composed with, sorry, f2 composed with f1 is equal to f of f2 composed with f of f1, which is nice. Okay. Sorry, what's, oh, what's the, the comment about this? Uh, we do or don't get that. We do, so we do get this, yeah, which is, which is a nice property. That's a good property. That means when we're um, trying to lift an expression, we can basically just kind of lift all the symbols in it and kind of not worry about the plumbing so much. 
Okay. So this formula, this formula here, is the key to forward automatic differentiation. Okay? So, and it's the key because it tells you how to do two things. If g is a primitive, so a primitive arithmetic operator, like plus or sine or something like that, then it tells you how it should be lifted from operating on real numbers to operating on dual numbers. Okay, so for example, if we um, were to transform sine. Um, so f sine is also the same as sine with an arrow. On yeah, it. sorry, I should, I, should put it, I should put an f on this or something. Okay. Right, so just for example, if we're taking um, a lifted sign, what what will that do? Well, it will um, it'll do what it's supposed to do on the primal part, and it will also have well, in this case, the Jacobian is just one by one, so that's just the scalar, and that happens to be cosine of x times x prime. More parentheses there. Okay, so this formula tells us how we should lift primitives. It also tells us if we do this to a big computation, what will the result be? Well, it'll be this Jacobian vector product in addition to what it originally calculated. Okay, so that's forward automatic differentiation. So in practice, what does this mean? I mean, does this mean that uh, you have to come up with the transformations from the G's to the FGs for all the primitives that you have uh, in yeah. your language, and then apply them to your, the code that you had for your function uh, to get the code that you have for uh, FG. Yes, exactly. That's exactly right. If you if you lift all of the primitives, then everything else comes along for the ride. Like define functions that come along for the ride. Why don't you show us multiply? Uh, <coughs> sure. Okay. So. Um, Okay, so I'm not sure about the notation here, so I'll use Haskell notation in honor of our eminent. <laughs> so um, if we transform the multiplication operator, and it's going to take two arguments here. It'll take um, x paired with x prime. Each of them themselves pairs. Oh, oh, I see. Like that. Y prime? Yeah, right. Code. Um, well, okay, so you could imagine currying. That's actually a, a question of representation, whether you should um, interleave the... So when you have a vector of dual numbers, when, when, when you lift, a, say, a, ve a vector of reals, should the lifted thing be a vector of dual numbers, or should it be a vector of reals paired with a vector of the, the prime part? And that's just a, a that's just a memory layout question. That's not like a fundamental question, right? It's whether it's basically row major versus column major, um, and I'm going with row major. <laughs> okay. Um, so what would that be? Well, so it'll be a pair of <coughs> x times y. Okay. And then, well, what's the Jacobian of this? Thing, right? Well, it takes two numbers as input, one as output. And so the, the derivative of x times y with respect to x is y, and with respect to y is x. So the Jacobian of multiplication at the point um, xy, and now we get into, oh, well, I wish I had not created it, right? <laughs> okay. Um, Um, the Jacobian at that point will be, well, it's it's some, it's got to have the dimensionality. It's got to be one by two, right? So it'll be a matrix. It's that big, right? And um, this it'll they'll be backwards basically, x, right? So then here we get um, we'll get y x prime plus x y prime. Does that? Okay. Right. 
So there's a zillion packages available to do this kind of thing. Um, there's basically there's two main implementation strategies. Wait, so, so this, this is, gonna, this is, gonna this is just for expressions, mode. right? Hmm? It's going to work for expressions, right? So application and composition and so right. But you led off with all of this by saying, ah, oh, but we want to handle sharing and loops and who knows what kind of Oh, well, for this, we just won't, we, for this, we just won't worry about it. Because these dual numbers will just be carried on through. They're in for the ride. No, I don't understand. So we're lifting the computation. So if I take f of a loop, what happens? What do I get? Oh, you mean of a, like an iterate to fixed point kind of loop? Uh, yeah. Or, I mean, or it's, a, it's or fine if it's like, or, it's or fine a, if it's a loop over the elements of an array or, or, some, or something like that. x equal blah in blah? Oh, that works. That's complicated. It, it, just, it just works. It, it, but the, the thing is, if you're basically computing this funny epsilon that has epsilon squared equals zero, so you'll happily compute a derivative even at places where the thing is clearly not differentiable. Yeah. You get some answer out. The uh, sure. Well, the uh, the, the, you, formula, you, the form of the form of expression with the O of epsilon square would alert you to the fact that oh, this is not differentiable. I'm a actually getting something that depends on the little O of epsilon square. Well, okay. Uh, so there's two ways things can be. Well, there's three ways things can be non-differentiable. Um, one of them is if they're in a branch cut. So if you're in an if boundary, but you're right at the edge, and there, and there, there's like you can multi, there's ways of defining the derivative, so it's okay. So let's not worry about that. Another way that can be non-differentiable is if it invokes a primitive at a point where that primitive is not differentiable, like a log of zero, something like that. Um, and you can even have primitives where, where they're they're defined. It's, so log of zero is not defined at all, right? But you could have primitives that are defined but not differentiable, like signum. Or absolute value at zero, something like that. And in that case, you have two options. Your system can either give some number, or it can give not a number for the derivative part, right? For the so so when you when you lift this thing, so the f of the primitive, you have to decide what you're going to do do with those. Yeah. So look, it's these these are these become policy questions that that basically. Um, um, at the same level as like the details of IEEE floating point arithmetic, where there's reasons for defining things in places where maybe it's not quite mathematically defined or making it kind of work out. So like, well, what should the derivative of absolute value at zero be? Oh, probably zero, because if you make it not a number, like you'll contaminate your, your stuff where it's probably not such a big deal. And if people really want to know if they're there, they should test them. So, you know, the, the, but that gets into fiddly numerics issues. You guys are asking a much more complicated question than the one I was asking, <laughs> which is that okay. I, I thought you were saying we take it as it were the source code of a program and we transform it into a new program, which does this uh, sort of shows these pairs around. Right, that's right. Uh, now, I think you're telling me that the way you do that is you don't change the source code at all. You just change the implementation of some primitives and you run the original source code. That's exactly right. Right now, that's not obvious that that does the right thing, but you claim it does. Yeah. Uh, well, so this equation is the key to saying it'll do the right thing. Oh, really? Because any arbitrary code, and loops, and all that. <coughs> why do I can't okay. see that? So, so fine. this this okay. equation doesn't say what to do with higher order functions. Now, some higher order functions, the the numerics are just like map or something like that. The numbers are just flowing through, and it's just okay, because basically. If you take your program and you trace the real numbers through it, you get a data flow graph. This process is really operating on that data flow graph. So it doesn't care about the scaffolding that created that data flow graph. All it cares about is the flow of real numbers through the computation. And so, so then, th then you're OK. Except the, the one example I gave, which is iterate to fixed point, right? where you have a numeric iterate to approximate fixed point operator. Because then the data flow graph is itself data. Dependent. Yeah, exactly. Because then the data flow graph has a cycle, and it becomes unclear what, what, what you should do. And that's a subject for another talk. But it's known what you should do. And similarly, conditionals? I know. Conditionals are OK, because the conditional just depends on, basically, that gets resolved when you run the program. And so you get some data flow graph. I see. It's a data flow graph. Yeah. And if your input had been different, you would have gotten a different data flow graph. So it goes. Provided you. So then you need a transfer. You need one of these primitive things for each node of the graph, of which if is one. So we do need a story for if. Yeah. Do it if it's easy. Well, okay. So there's an example that motivated an entire mathematical discipline, which is um, so they wanted to take the derivative of the following function. It's called synthetic differential geometry. If x equals zero, then zero, else 
x. And they wanted to take the derivative of, of that um, using these kinds of formal methods rather than limits, right? You know, symbolic manipulation rather than limits. That's what I called synthetic differential geometry. And so if you, if you run this through your, automatic through your forward automatic differentiation system and ask for what's the derivative at 0, it'll tell you 0. But it's not, right? It's a 1, obviously. This is the identity function. It's, the derivative is 1 everywhere, OK? So um, the, you remember at the beginning I said there's certain things we're not going to worry about? This is what we're not going to worry about. <laughs> but you can give yeah. Simon a rule for if. If L P of x, then f else g differentiates to if P of x, then f prime else g prime. Um, well, right, but in this case, this zero. Yeah, because yeah, I don't get the right answer sometimes, but yeah. <laughs> we still need to move. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you see, you're, you're much more well, well, no, this th this would always this would definitely give the wrong answer. Yeah. So, and there, I, I don't think there's any patch for this. No, but that's yeah. but the, the transformation is, is the one that you described, right? Because in this particular case, the wrong answer here, and yeah. the right answer for the one we care so, about, which is so, quadratic turning okay. into a linear. So, so to get to get really deep on this, and I'm, I'm, I, I apologize. For it. So, if, when when you run a program, um, a numeric program, you get some data flow graph. And let's forget about about um, loops in that data flow graph. Let's just say you, you get a data flow graph. Well, um, and then particular values flow along that. So the particular inputs to the program are being used in two ways. One is to set up that data flow graph, its shape. Right? And that happens because of conditionals and stuff like that. And the other is the actual values that flow through that graph. Now, um, that graph can, um, well, basically, if you take your input space and you cut it up into regions, where within each region you get the same data flow graph, then the boundaries of these regions you're not guaranteed to get the right derivative. And that's what's happening here, is in, space has been chunked up into three regions. right? unnecessarily in this case, because they actually dovetail perfectly. So it goes. OK. Um, so l let me, let me um, get to reverse automatic differentiation, which is, which is much cooler. Right? OK. Um, so let's get rid of this stuff. So I'm more of kind of a geometric thinker. I like, like I guess, double E. I like boxes and arrows rather than all these al all this algebraic stuff. So let me write down that formula with a box and arrows formulation. Okay. So we have x, and it goes into f, and out comes y. Now we want to do this transformation to it, right? So in this transformation, what we've done, no, that's not a pretty nice color. No, any color with so Yeah. OK. Um, I had a collaborator who was colorblind, so I learned to never use red. So it's good there's no red ones here. Approve. OK. Um, so when we do this lifting business, we also get this, um, this x prime thing, and we get out this y prime, and they're related by this linear function, which is the Jacobian of f at x. Okay. And if we agglomerate all these things together, <coughs> these things together are x, right, is this dual number, and this is this dual number, and this is the lifted f. Now, just looking at that one, look at that green data flow there. Well, let's say I wanted to do something. Now, this is just a linear function. If f is some primitive function, then this is like some tiny little Jacobian matrix, like 2 by 1 or 2 by 2 maybe for sign. Or it's, you know, there's, there's a couple numeric primitives that are 2 by 2, right? like sine cos on a complex argument or something. Um, but OK, so let's. Let's do the following um, thing. Let's just run this thing backwards. Not the whole graph, just, just half of it. So 
let's define something else I'll call y bar. And that'll come down. And I'm going to take the transpose of this thing. So we'll forget about this, because now we've got transposes going on. And this y bar will come into this transpose thing, and it'll come out, and we'll get x bar out. Okay. So inverse would obey, it would, the inverse would have the right dimensions, but um, it, 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 might not even be a, it might not even be a square matrix. Like in the case of multiplication there, it, it was a one by two matrix. Mm -hmm. so, um, so you can't take its inverse. So you could imagine taking the pseudo inverse or something. I don't know if anybody's tried that. Um, I, 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 I've, I've idly speculated that maybe that would be something interesting to do, but I don't know. Um, but the transpose is what you do. <laughs> and there's a very deep reason for that that I'll explain later in that other talk I'm supposed to give. <laughs> OK. Um, but so, OK. So if we do this, then these things are flowing in the other direction. Right? Well, so first of all, um, when we did the forward mode, it was, it was cool because we could flow the um, the derivative values, the extra new values, alongside the original ones. So it was clear that the complexity properties of the program hadn't really changed by much, right? Like storage had gone up by a factor of two because you had twice as many numbers floating around. And the numeric primitives um, had to do a little bit of extra arithmetic, so maybe division would take, I don't know, five times as long, and the other ones would be less overhead than that. So you had, we had a nice complexity bound. But here, we, um, you have the same complexity bound on operation count, where Doing these little matrices, the operation count will go up only a little, right? You know, by a factor of some some handful, right? But because you've got your data flow graph is being paralleled by this new data flow graph, where all, where the things are going in the other direction, you have to kind of store the whole data flow graph. You have to kind of remember it in some way, so that you can do this stuff backwards. So this is reverse automatic differentiation. Okay. And if you think about a big computation, so if this f is a, is a, is a big defined function, then um, it's made out of lots of little ones. And um, so the forward data flow graph had lots of little things, and they'd all be transposed, and things would flow backwards, and you get the, you get the big matrix transpose there. So, so that works out nice. So you run the program forwards and generate some sort of trail, then you stick y bar in and sort of run it backwards through the trail. Exactly. That's exactly right. OK, maybe you stick many y bars in. Possibly. Or maybe are you typically only interested in one? Well, y bar, in general, if f is high dimensional, then y bar will be a vector. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But and so you, you'd have some big. But you typically do you want to feed in one y bar and then choose a different y bar. Is that common? Yeah, well, so that's a good point. So you could do that with forward mode also. Yeah, yeah, you could, yeah. You could, so that's so called. That's the well. they, call that, um, they call that tangent vector mode, um, which is terrible because there are already vectors floating around. And it should be called stacked tangents mode. So when you do forward, if you're carrying more than one um, perturbation for each real number, then those are sort of stacked on top of each other. And you can do this. You could do stacked reverse. To my knowledge, nobody's implemented stacked reverse. Um, but there's conceptually no difficulty with it, of course, right? I mean, it's it's just interleaving computations, and right. I mean, it's just yeah. Um, and and that would make sense, especially if you want to know the whole Jacobian. Then you could feed in a, um, a bunch of these that form like a basis for the output space more than input space. Um, and that's what people do in, in, in practice, although there's computation tricks in there. But, but, but that's right. So basically, to do this reverse mode, we're going to have to have some representation for the, um, for the data flow graph and then run stuff backwards through it. So there's two main implementation strategies. Well, wait, before we get into the implementation, the yes. obvious question okay. that's begging to be asked is, yes. doesn't this seem like a bad idea? Just do the forward thing. We're done. Or we'll go home. Never mind. Well, let's say you want to calculate a gradient. So the op so let's say you have a million inputs. So it's a neural network. It has a million weights, and you want to calculate the gradient of the error with respect to those weights. Um, so if you do it with forward mode, you'll have to do um, you'll have to do a million forward passes on the thing. Whereas if you do it in this with this reverse mode, you'll just have to do one backwards pass. Now you may have to store some stuff in the, in the meantime, but it's a small, like this, it's a little bit of storage for a lot of time. Is the is the story here just dependent on the sizes of n and m? 
I mean, is there a simple story? Like, the example you gave there, N is very high dimensional because it's all the weights in your neural network, yeah, and right. M is one dimensional because yeah. it's just the scalar error function right. that you're trying to minimize. Yes. So does one thing make sense for large N, small M, and the other way around, or is it not such a simple story? Yeah, well, so... So sometimes people want to know the whole Jacobian. I mean, there's, there's yeah. various settings where you want that. Sometimes they want it just because they want to know its principal eigenvectors or something like that. And then you could argue, well, they shouldn't, even though they want it, they shouldn't have it. They should use a power method or something. But um, sometimes people want the Jacobian for, for reasons aside from optimization, for, you know, there's, 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 there's other things. And in that case, um, yeah, there's trade-offs. You can either use multiple forward passes or multiple reverse passes. You can imagine using some combination thereof. Um, there are, in fact, our algorithms that can do combinations thereof. Um, depending on the shape of the data flow graph, um, so imagine that the data flow graph like, gets all bushy and then, and then gets small again. So here's, here's the data flow, right? You've got like, some pretty high dimensional input, and it comes through to some pretty small cut, right? So this is a small waste in the data flow graph, and then it gets fat again, and then you get your output like that. Um, well, if you had a data flow graph like that, and you're trying to calculate the full Jacobian, well, you could imagine trying to use some trick, right? Let, let, let's say both the input and output are much higher dimensional than that waste. You could imagine using some trick where you, you just calculate the Jacobian to this waste and the Jacobian there, and there's all kinds of, of work on doing that kind of thing. Um, but, it, but it's hard because that requires you to construct the whole data flow graph and maybe the point of this is these data flow graphs are dynamic, right? You, know, you don't really know what they are until you run the program and so it's all kinds of touchy issues. Um, yeah. There's also, if you're doing reverse mode um, and you, wanna, you don't want to store this whole big data flow graph, well maybe what you could do is um, you could store enough information to reconstruct it. So you could so, so take this picture here. Let's say your, your your whole data flow graph goes like this. Let's say we cut it, and um, we'll remember the states of all of the. We we won't um, store the whole graph. We'll just store. Um, we'll, we'll go up to here, and then we'll remember all the live stuff here, right? and then we'll do reverse mode through this, and then we'll have remembered this, and then we'll do reverse mode back through there. So that cuts down. You only have to store half of it, right? But you have to run the first half twice, right? Because you're you're in the second half with reverse mode, so you can accumulate this whole thing and then come back to here, and then and then you're in the first half again. And in general, under some storage bound, um, this you, you get a log factor, right? So it takes a, lo a log factor more work, but you but you you um, save a lot of storage. I'm, I'm going to ask another naive question. So I'm trying to get. Oh, that's, I should say that's called checkpoint reverse. Just. I'm just trying to still get an intuition for when forward automatic differentiation makes sense and when reverse automatic differentiation makes sense. So let me run the hypothesis by you. So forward automatic differentiation tells us, gives us from our original function a function that tells us how sensitive is the output to changes in the input. Well, it tells you if you change the input in some direction, how will, what direction, direction will the output change and, and how much. Yeah. So, yes. Uh, That's whereas right. reverse automatic differentiation tells us how sensitive is the input to changes in the output. Okay. So, so yeah. I think terminologically, I would say forward mode propagates perturbations. So it says if you make a perturbation of the input, what's the consequent perturbation on the output? That's intuitively. And very re nice. and reverse mode does the same thing, but in the opposite direction, but with sensitivities. Right. So if something far away has some sensitivity to the outputs of your process, what are its sensitivities to the input? That's right. reverse mode. Yeah. So and for back, like reverse is just like backprop, basically. Reverse is backprop is a special case of reverse. Yeah. Yes. Whereas uh, you know you could imagine trying to do a simulation in the forward direction and say, well, if I just modified my input in this direction, x prime, what would, you know what would the output look like? And then forward. Would make that's right. Sometimes you're you're interested in that. Like if you you know, if I make this building higher, what will it do to the rainfall patterns downstream or the wind patterns downstream? And that that, that would be a forward thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So, all right. 
So implementation. <laughs> All right, there's two main implementation strategies. One is um, to basically overload the um, arithmetic operators um, to operate on these dual numbers. And um, in some languages, that's done using very dynamic mechanisms. In others, like, I don't know, C++ or Haskell or something like that, it's done using the, the, some kind of object or class system or something like that. Um, but, to, but you do it by overloading operators. Right? And the other strategy is to take the code and to pre-process it where you take each variable and you make a new variable, which is the dual, like the, the dual part for that variable, and blow your program up by, in, in that way. This now, obviously, forward for forward, just okay, for forward. both for forward, yeah, fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, obviously, these two things are deeply equivalent in that you could specialize the, right, and de-scaffold and de whatever -ify the overloading approach to, get, to give you these extra ones, but in practice, um, the overloading approach gives up a very large constant factor in efficiency. And so all of the high performance systems are preprocessors. Now, I want you to imagine some people who are really into numeric programming, who don't know lambda calculus, who don't know anything but Fortran, and maybe C, maybe, implementing this preprocessor. And they'd get their buddies, and they'd work on this for decades, and they'd get these preprocessors going. And these preprocessors, um, well, they're baby compilers, right? And you think, well, it's like a little baby compiler. And there's, opti there's opportunities for optimization. Like you know that some dual parts are zero. And these preprocessors generally also do reverse mode. So there's, there's all kinds of little, there's opportunities in reverse mode for optimization where like, oh, should you store x squared or should you recalculate it because you already have x in a register? You know, these are the, the sorts of issues that compilers are supposed to do, right? But, but now, now this, this preprocessor is supposed to do it. So you end up with this host of little niggly issues, like the language accepted by the preprocessor has slightly different semantics than the, than the idea of the semantics of Fortran that your compiler has, which is going to happen next, right? Or it accepts only a subset of the language. And maybe you want to nest things to get second derivatives, but, when you, um, but the output of this tool is, um, is a slightly larger subset of Fortran than it will accept in its input. Um, uh, so it, it, for examples of parts of Fortran that these preprocessors do not deal with is external function arguments. So you can't take the derivative of an optimization routine simply because it will reject the program. It'll say, I can't take the derivative of a function that takes a functional argument. So. Um, so these things are pretty, so, and also, well, you know, you've got some great big Fortran program. You don't want the derivatives of all the routines in there. You only want some of them. So there's some extra little language for specifying what you want, some language of annotations for what derivatives you want. And then for the functions that, whose derivatives you do want, well, actually, you only want some of the variables. You are, only some of the inputs are of interest, maybe only some of the outputs. Um, and so these, these tools are, are a little bit, a little bit tricky to use that way, but they're much faster. And so what we're trying to do is to um, sort of cut the difference on that and um, make, make something where we, the, the automatic differentiation is in the language, so, the, so, so just higher order functions. So f and r, like, like I had there, are in the language. You can use them as if they're like runtime <coughs> constructs, right? You know, just like you'd use map, right? You don't worry about it. Uh, but then there's an aggressive compilation technology to migrate all of the transformations to compile time, or maybe some of the transformations to compile time. Currently, all of our systems migrate all of the transformations to compile time, and if they're, the pr program is too dynamic and it can't, it'll reject the program. Um, but, but we're trying to do it one that doesn't reject the program now, right? Um, okay. Hey, just for the purpose of planning, so yes. we, we have some kind of mixed one to two hour slot for this. The first hour is over now, yeah. and but nobody has stormed into the room yet. So um, I, I don't know if uh, if people would like to leave at this point if, because they have other obligations. I'd like to give them a graceful opportunity <laughs> to do that. Um, Otherwise, maybe we could take a little break, uh, have a coffee, then come back. Or here, or to Indigo. Um, I think if 
Um, if nobody's storming the room here, we may be we may be good here and could just stay here. Um, but I haven't been able to find the the room in the system, so um, I don't actually know what it's officially called. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great <laughs> mystery. <laughs> okay. Um, is that um, any thoughts on this? A quick coffee, come back. Quick coffee, come back, and whoever would like to disappear can do that. All right. That's true. Sure. sure. I should say this is a table of benchmarks for various automatic differentiation systems. Um, the top line is, is, is ours, and everything and that's normalized to one, and bigger is worse. Um, these, are the, these are the Fortran systems. I see. Um, so you win big, right? <laughs> those are lousy. <laughs> that's just that very clever. So what's your input language? Oh, for Stalin. Well, okay, for Stalingrad, the input language is a language called Vlad. <laughs> Vlad. Um, and you can tell by these names that Jeff Siskin did, 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 did all the hard, all the heavy lifting, because he names all of his systems after brutal dictators. And in in, in, th in this case, it's called Stalingrad because it brutally optimizes the code. Um, and Vlad is basically a uh, it's an eager lambda calculus um, with, with, with a numeric basis. And I.O. handled in an odd hack fashion. That this guy skips our famous dictator. Never mind. <laughs> Coffee, and then continue. So what we did is we implemented AD in Fortran. Now, I said there are all these preprocessing systems that have Fortran, right, that, 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 that are based on Fortran. Well, but they have all these procrustean rules like they can't take derivatives of just anything. They they can't take external function parameters, and they don't nest. And they have this other little language for specifying derivatives, and um, derivatives can only be taken basically on function boundaries. So if there's something you want to take the derivative of, you have to define a function and then run it through the preprocessor to, to, to take the derivative of that. Well, but it's Fortran, so it's, that function can't be a closure, right? <laughs> so so how you know it, it, your your code gets all nasty looking. Um, so we decided to try to do a blank slate implementation of automatic differentiation at the language design level in Fortran 77. So we decided to put in f automatic differentiation constructs in the language, not externally, by adding new block constructs to Fortran 77. In our implementation technology, one could implement it directly by trying to add knowledge of these facilities to a Fortran compiler, like um, uh, F to J would be the obvious candidate. Um, but instead, the way our implementation works is um, it's a pre-preprocessor. So what it does is it takes your code, which is written in this odd dialect of Fortran that we call Farfel Fortran, um, and sends forward and reverse language extension, right? Or in reverse formula trend, right? Okay. Um, so it, so it takes your Farfel Fortran code and it does a bunch of machinations to it to render it suitable for using in the current generation of Fortran AD preprocessors. And then it, it also kicks out a shell script for invoking them appropriately. If you have nesting going on, you need that, right? And and then you, you run that shell script, and it runs the, the AD preprocessors, and it targets either Addisee or Tapanad, like however many times it needs to until it gets your program, and then it compiles it and links it, and everything's all hunky-dory. So let me show you how this looks. Um, OK. So, right, so we want to AD first class. Um, sorry? Shows the code. Yeah, right. So that's, that's my, my plan. OK. This is just to point out that this is a somewhat peculiar thing to do. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. So let me let me. Okay. So here's how you compute a derivative. So this is a block construct for computing the forward um, to do forward AD on that little hunk of code there. So what you do is you put in tangent vectors at the beginning. Right, these the, the the dual part of the dual numbers are called tangent vectors because it's, that, that's um, for differential geometry, and and then you extract them at the end. And so the compiler there can see well. For example, there's pi. We didn't set a tangent on pi there, so pi has a tangent of zero. So the pre preprocessor can 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 know that. And okay, so that that's what these block constructs look like. Here's reverse mode. So 
Now, let me just point out, um, so reverse mode, you have to run the primal, and then you set the cotangents of the outputs, and then a reverse phase happens, and then you can get out the cotangents of the inputs. So here, right, this is the cotangent of an output, right, and, and then this is the cotangents of the inputs that get read out. And you can make arguments like how to order these either way. We decided to do it this way, okay? Right. So this is an extension of Fortran. So you're adding some new stuff to Fortran. Yes, this is, these are two new block constructs. Two new block constructs. Okay, yeah. you're going to scatter anywhere in the middle of the state. Just like a do loop. Yeah. Okay. You can put them wherever you want. And then your tool is going to transform them out. That's right. Uh, almost. It's going to transform them out into Fortran, which can then be passed to one of these standard ADP processors. Oh. So our tool doesn't know anything about derivatives. All it knows about is closures, right? Okay, so in order to understand what you've done, we have to both understand the semantics of these constructs, and we have to understand the semantics of the output. You'll, you'll see. It'll, I think, I think it, but, you know. And these constructs mean so, so I still haven't got that. So right. Like this. What is this okay. To do? So what this means is we want to do an AD, a forward automatic differentiation of this hunk of code. Okay, so that's the F button. It's forward. Right, exactly. And where we've attached a non zero um, uh, dual, you know, dual number value to that sigma of one. So is sigma a variable that's in scope? Yeah, it right. It's, it's some variable in scope because it's right there. Okay, and it's tangent. That's a keyword. Yeah, that's a keyword. Hence the green, exactly. Okay, I see. Okay. But is sigma introduced by this, or was it already in scope? No, sigma is already in scope. Okay. Yeah. Sigma already has a value, right? I mean, th 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 this is uh, an, um, a Gaussian, just right? A, a Gaussian. Okay, so sigma is some random scalar variable that is in scope. Yeah, scale that's right. Point. That's right. Okay. Exactly. And this is just giving the dual part of the dual number that has sigma, right? That, that, that sigma is transformed to when you do the forward transform of this little hunk of code. Okay, and similarly with reverse mode, except um, you have to give the cotangent of an output. So, so I still haven't finished the first thing. <laughs> so oh, do and this the, F thing right. on a function which is the body of the code. Yeah. So some of those, presumably phi is the output here. But if there were lots and lots of lines in that body, then would they all be outputs? Or do you not yes, make yes. some of those outputs? You, you can put commas between multiple variables. No. Uh, temp 1 equals square 2 pi sigma squared. Yeah. Phi equals 1 over temp 1 time x. Yes, you can. That's x. fine. No problem. No problem. Uh, derivative of temp 1 gets computed. Yes. Um, but somehow it isn't named in that last line. No one said tangent of temp 1. You, you can name it or not, if you want the tangent or not. If you, if you don't extract it, then it's, then it, then it's gone. If you want it, then, then you put it yeah. there and you get so it. So if you didn't want it, it might be faster not to name it. I suppose, yeah. yeah. That's right. Well, no, but look, that that, that's an optimization issue, whether the, yeah. you know, the, the downstream compiler will, you know, is basically invariant in naming sub-expressions. One would hope it would be, right? Right. Do, do you have the code that it expands to? Yes. Right. yes. So, but, but for a much bigger example. <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> so now we're going to use this. So this is defining a gradient routine using forward mode and using reverse mode. Okay, so this is a higher order function written in Fortran. I don't know if you guys know this, but Fortran is a, is a very nice higher order language, right? It's got, it, it doesn't have closures, but it, it has function parameters. <laughs> and you can't return anything, so. This F thing, that's a function. That's right, that's what external means in Fortran. Oh, does it say anything about how many arguments it takes? No. Useful like that. No, 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 that would be too easy. It would violate modularity to say that because it's already present somewhere else in the code, right? You can infer it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's this Fortran 77. What can I tell you? This, that's not our idea. We just this Fortran 77. <laughs> it's something you should only call grad on a passing functions of two arguments. Uh, in this case, yeah, that's right. And if you passed it a function with only one argument, something that would happen. Uh, I would imagine so. Yes. All right. The well, loop is supposed to cross the Atlantic. Yeah, boom, boom. <laughs> Sorry? Where? Oh. Parsing the... Uh, <laughs> you use 1492 as a label. Oh, yes. Right. So there's a reason for that. See that. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway. Um, 
right? And this is similar for, for, for doing the gradient using reverse mode. And what's nice is that the API of these two functions is identical, even though one of them uses forward and one of them uses reverse. And in fact, the API doesn't even expose the fact that it's using AD at all, right? I mean, F is just a, a function. And if Fortran allowed you to declare its type, its type would be you know, an array of doubles and, and the size of that array um, and to, to a double. The right-hand side of the put attribute value is evaluated before you enter the block or at the end of the block? Um, it's evaluated at the end of the block, and then the reverse phase is done, and then the end of the, and, and then the, the finalizer there, the, the ADR, the, the, the extraction is done. Yeah. So, so, so this happens before that, but they both happen after that. Okay. If you put y, uh, if you put y on the right hand side of the cotangent y equals, would you get the initial y or the y after the end of the computation? Um, you would get whatever you set it to in this case. Is y the return value? Well, so the, the, so y is not returned at all, right? Y is dropped on the floor in this particular hunk of code. Well, what's the return of function grad? It doesn't return anything. It's a subroutine. Ah, but it's Fortran, so the return is put in this variable. Fortran only has scalar functions. So if you want a higher dimensional function, you, you can only do it by passing things by reference, which probably you shouldn't use any regular functions in Fortran. You should always pass by, you know, pass that way for symmetry. It's nice. It makes calling and returning symmetric. OK. All right. So oops. So yeah, oh, and this is using implied do syntax for, for, for um, getting them out. That's that i equal 1 to n, by the way, which is for any syntax, um, okay, right? You see, I, there's no i is not declared, right? There's no, it's not in scope, it's, it's, so it's local. That's an implied do. Okay, so now let's take something. So here we would said we're going to define argmax, which uh, argmax, and I'm, I'm going to build up to a really complicated code here. Okay, <laughs> like, like like bear with me. Um, okay, so here we're using these facilities to implement a checkpointed reverse mode where um, we, uh, we have this function that um, right, we're going to call f on x returning y, and then we'll call g on y returning z. And we want to do um, reverse mode transform of that, so get from a sensitivity of z to a sensitivity of x. But we're going to do it in two steps, so that we don't have to save the whole computation graph of f and of g at the same time. So see, first we do f to get up to y. And then we do g with this reverse mode business to save it, to save the computation graph there. And then we do f again, but with the reverse, but, but, but saving its computation graph. So this is powerful enough to do stuff, at least a static um, checkpoint reverse, which um, other uh, Fortran-based systems are not capable of doing at the user level. Um, OK, so here's a, um, a line search. And it does this line search using, um, oh, so it calls argmax, right? <laughs> okay, and argmax internally is using automatic different, you know, it's, it's taking a gradient. Um, okay, or a, I guess it's a line search, so it's not a, it wouldn't be a gradient, it would be a perturbation. Okay, so let me, let me okay, so here's, the, here's our benchmark task. Um, here, let, me, let me just show. So this is going to be a, um, a non-zero-sum continuous strategy game. There's two players, um, Apple and Banana. They both sell um, markets in the like boutique consumer goods, right? Um, and they don't make exactly the same thing, but they're somewhat fungible, right? Nice shirts, pretty computers, kind of fungible, right? But not, 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 not quite. So now it's not necessary that there's an equilibrium to a game like this because it's non-zero-sum. But if there is, it has to satisfy these two relations, right? That A, A's strategy is stable and B's strategy is stable, 
right? Then you then right, okay. So if, if neither of them can change. Of little a. Sorry. What's the type of little? In a? this case, it's just a real number. But one can imagine being a vector if the, if they produce more than one thing. So a strategy is a single number. Yes, it's a price. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, right, right. Sorry. Um, right. So to solve this, there's there's various ways of solving this. One thing you can do is alternate optimization called coordinate descent, where you alternate solving one and then the other. And you go back and forth until it stabilizes. Um, that is very poorly numerically conditioned in this case and would take tens of thousands of iterations to converge, um, even though capital A and capital B are both quadratic. However, um, you can try to directly solve for an optimum using that. Um, and in this case, because A and B are both quadratic, it, you, that happens in one, one Newton step. So it finds a solution in one Newton step, which is nice. Um, so OK, so how would you do that? Well, see, there's that arg each of those argmaxes um, involves two levels of nesting, because they're using Newton's methods. Right? So each of them needs a second derivative. And then to solve the whole equation, there's one more application of, of right? You've got to use a root finder there, right? I mean, to solve an equation like that, you have to find a root of, of, of something. So we get five levels of derivatives nested. OK. Um, so here's the code. That's, that's the thing. And OK, it's not as pretty as it would be in a functional language, but it's not that bad, right? I mean, once you get over the syntax, it's not so terrible. You've got, we've got our big A, big B, right? A star, B star, argmax, right? OK, it forces us to, you, know, you don't have as many lets as you'd like, but you know, it's not so bad. Right? No. You, you, yeah. You're forced to write all caps? Fortran! <laughs> <laughs> it's not case sensitive. It's not case sensitive. It's traditional to write it in all caps. <laughs> and on punch cards, right? That was that's why we it's supposed to be like a punch. Card. <laughs> okay, so and then he, so there's the code. That's the main thing. It's find this equilibrium of this two-player game. Here's all the all, all the um, utility functions: um, argmax, root finder, first derivative, second derivative. I see, so argmax is implemented as a root finder. That's right. Yeah. Exactly so. Exactly so. Um, okay. So basically, right, the, the, the way it works is we've got to get rid of all these blocks. Um, we've got to get rid of all the fancy stuff. OK, so let me just show how it works. Um, OK, so the first thing that happens is all of the, the AD blocks are turned into nested subroutines, right? Because the, the, the subroutine boundary is the natural boundary for, for doing, for, for taking, so you have to break them out into functions. Um, then. Um, Closure conversion is used to move those to top level. Um, then, um, well, so now you'd think that we'd be done, because you could just ask, right? It, it would just be up to linkage. This is some special like AD call that's supposed to be calling the AD transform version of that. And so then you would emit some the right stuff to tell the tool to do that. Not good enough, because this takes a functional argument. And the tools can't handle things that have external functions, right? That have, ex that have functional arguments. So we have to specialize them. So, so closure conversion is, is that the idea that I take the closure with me and make it part of my context? Um, closure conversion. So a closure contains two things, code and environment. Where the environment is the values of the variables that it was closed over. So the variables that it references, which were apparent at the point where it was defined. And what closure conversion is, is you just you take the code and you move it to the top level, but you give it an extra argument, which is the values of these variables whose context it was defined in. And then when you call it, you pass this extra argument. I see. Right. Um, so you can see there that's happening. Um, there's something that's live there, I don't know, x bar. So you see how when that's been moved to top level, x bar has been added as an extra argument there. OK. Um, so then we specialize. So in this case, quad is, so this is just an example. Um, so we, 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 we specialize, right? Everything that takes a functional argument that's target of AD has to be specialized. And so you, you specialize it for. And that involves finding the call graph and all that stuff, right? And obviously, this can, in the worst case, cause you know an exponential blow up in the size of your program. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, and 
So then we have to deal with the linkages. So this is the linkage convention for Tapanad, where the, um, the transformed version of um, main ADF1 is main ADF1 G1. Okay. Um, and so here's the full example. So this is the transformed version of that code that I showed before. And remember, before it fit on two slides with really great big fonts, right? And, and this is not such a big font. Um, but anyway, it's been all blown up to, to remove all that stuff that the preprocessors can't handle. This is the ArcMax uh, example. Oh, sorry, the yeah, this is that AB game example, Apple, banana game. Yeah. Except now you've actually defined Big B for us, which we haven't seen before. Um, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Which is nice. I think they're pretty. It, and Big A, so now we can actually see that they are quadratic. In where, 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 I, mean, I mean, they, would, they wouldn't have to. They could be. The uh, top left is the yeah. uh, 0.7 down the left. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, I mean, they wouldn't have to be quadratic. It's just, you know. Yeah, okay. Uh, right, and then here's the script for calling top and not appropriately. Um, and there you go. So, okay. So I don't know if that answers the questions that people. So Tapanad was called on that thing we just saw. Yeah, Tapanad being a, an AD preprocessor. That's right. So Tapanad is called on this, and this is the way you have to call it. Right. So, 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 so the tool that did, did that, which is called Farfallen, um, because it because it deals with Farfall Fortran, um, it j also generates the script for you. And there is one two ADF two. That's an encoding of of the arguments with which respect to which you do the differentiation. Um, that seems like a wild argument. Oh, are those the names of functions? Yeah, no, those those are the names of, of prefixy. Yeah, those are the yes, that's right. Those are the names of functions here. So you have to tell Tapanad which functions to take derivatives of. Um, so, 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 yeah. Root means the root of its call tree analysis. Okay. And it, it looks like it's taking the derivative of things that it's just, just constructed, right? This is like right, because it's itself. five levels of nesting, so it has to. But I thought you said they couldn't be applied to, that, to their own outputs. Um, sometimes they can be. We were careful to avoid constructs, which, um, which make that not possible. Which is basically arrays or reverse mode. Um, Tapanad, for example, you could you can nest forward mode, and then you can do one reverse mode. So you could have an you could have like nested, you know, sequence of them with one reverse somewhere in there, but only one. But these are all forward. These are all forward. The, the problem is scalar, so there's no. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, and I guess there's a benchmark. Oh, this is what the code looks like in, in a better language, right? A functional language. Okay. Um, so, and here's benchmarks. So, it, it, it's actually like after all of this stuff is done, is said and done, it's, it's almost as fast as Stalingrad. Which is pretty impressive. Um, now, to, this is with GCC 4.8. 4.7 gives away a, an order of magnitude because 4.8 allows you to do um, whole program uh, optimization. So, by using appropriate flags. And so we did that. So, so in this case, GCC had almost as, had as much opportunity for optimization as Stalingrad, because despite the fact that the program is necessarily distributed between multiple files because of all this you know, repeated invocation of Tapanad, it could gather it all together and do whole program analysis. And the code is simple enough, and it's only scalars. There's no structures. There's no arrays or anything, so it could de-scaffold. Right? You know, you know, so basically, what you're seeing here is the difference in um, <coughs> calling convention efficiency between the two, two implementations. What is the best um, operator overloading, let's say C++ implementation, do on this problem, this scalar problem? 
Um, well, so I have a benchmark. Um, hang on. Let me... yeah. um, where was that? Um, here. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think. This particular example is not here, but it, but 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 these but these are similar. That um, the saddle one is similar. That's a that's a, a bi-level optimization. Scalars. Yeah, that's right. This is um, this is all scalar just to make life easier, um, except for the back propagation one, which uses lists for arrays. Um, well, in, in, except in languages that support arrays. Um, so. I don't know if this answers your question, but these are the, roughly the kinds of numbers you're talking about. Right, so that the forward forward, so this that's forward scalar, forward vector, um, reverse forward nested on forward, forward nested on reverse, reverse nested on forward, et cetera. Um, yeah. And so th these are the operator overloading ones over here, these guys. Um, Fab bed plus plus uses uh, templates and tries to be kind of aggressive about it. CPPAD is very similar. ADOLC actually stores a, um, a data structure um, for, for doing reverse mode. Instead of using templates, it, store, it, it, it uh, writes a tape. Um, and then we, we implemented all this stuff in a variety of other higher order languages. Um, these are all different scheme implementations running the same code. Like you know, with small tweaks required to get it to run in the different implementations, right? But you know, programming language people often don't care that much about numerics. But you know, that's what computers are for, right? <laughs> like people build these billion-dollar fabs, you know. <laughs> and if if it's okay for computers to be forty percent slower, well, they wouldn't build all these GPUs, right? <laughs> so. Right, you know, I mean, small differences are, are actually kind of important for numeric code. Um, let's see. Uh, so my, so my, my plan here was to um, talk about um, some, to talk about some differential geometric basis for this kind of stuff, but I don't know if people are more interested in that or implementation and kinds of things, or calling it a day. Well, what do people actually, actually use it for in practice? When the people who don't really care about automatic differentiation just want to get the job, get some job done. What jobs do they use? It for? Right. So the main application I would say is design automation um, and sensitivity analysis. So, so design op optimiza optimization for things like this. Here's a bridge. We've got a bunch of free parameters, like the thickness of various structural members. Um, when you make them thicker, they cost more. Uh, they also weigh more, which has implications, right? So they're stiffer, but they, they weigh more. How can we um, make this bridge satisfy the, the engineering safety requirements it's supposed to have at minimal cost? Um, okay, can we answer that question by? So you would have some big objective function which involves um, you know, some matrices to do with the bridge, right? to do with the structure of the bridge, um, which, whose elements you know, come from these. Some of the elements are things you can control, and you, you can modify, and you, you, you end up with some kind of figure of merit. And then you take the gradient of that figure of merit with respect to the things you're allowed to fiddle with and, and use a gradient method on that. Oh, OK. So you sort of gradient descent kind of drive the yeah. Couldn't get trapped in Folsom Hill or something. Sure. Yeah. So if you've ever driven down the Turnpike in New Jersey, just south of Newark, there's a there's a bridge. It's a pretty substantial bridge. Um, I mean, it's not. Right. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a bridge that goes across the freeway, and in the middle of the bridge, there's a triangle of great big steel plates, like this thick and as wide as this room, coming down um, to a concrete abutment. And then abutment, there's plates coming up. And these plates coming down are curved at the end and have a big hole. And the ones at the bottom coming up have holes. And they, they interdigitate. 
right? And then there's a great big pin through them where that pin is like this fat, right? It's like a meter and a half wide going straight through that thing. And it's obviously so that the bridge can flex, right? So that it can, it can rotate around that. And my grandfather, Allah Shalom, was, was a structural engineer, so I asked him about this. Um, I said, is that to like allow it to flex? Does that make it like, you know, more, you know, say, you know, basically more stable. And he was like, no, no, of course not. Like, you want your bridge to be stiff. You don't want them wobbling around. The reason for that was um, that at the time, doing the analysis of the matrix that, that like, corresponding to the structural components of this bridge and figuring out what its eigenmodes would be was, was um, prohibitive. And putting this pin there so that it can flex in that fashion zeroes out um, a lot of elements of the matrix and gives it a certain block structure that makes it much easier to figure out its eigenvalues. <laughs> so this is an enormous thing. It's like a, it's this, this, it's this hunk of steel, probably as heavy as this whole building, right? It's like a really big hunk of steel. And it's there purely for computational convenience. That's <laughs> <laughs> a great story. Um, how did they calculate how big the pin needed to be? So maybe a smaller pin would have done. Well, no pin would have done it right. <laughs> like epoxy, there would have been good too, right? It's just they couldn't analyze it in that case. I think the more practical question. I mean, supposing we, we, we love this and we want to play with it, uh, is there a particular download you recommend for us to experiment with? So it depends what you want. I mean, if do you want like, are you going to use it in anger, or are you going to use, are you going to just goof around with it? <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> All the previous ones have involved a lot of that. I mean, do, do you care about the performance, or do you want to be like, you know, quick breadboarding things up? Um, yeah, I guess I care a bit about performance. So if you don't care much about performance, it depends what language you, your favorite language probably has some implementation. So Haskell has a nice one, um, sort of. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it was going so well for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, th there's a bunch of mature ones, right? Like pretty mature, like FabBad++ is pretty mature if you're into C++. We're doing an F-sharp one now, so I have a, uh -huh. a, a postdoc who's, who's got that using its reflective mechanisms. Oh, um, well, that's awesome, yes. Yeah. Uh, is that available? Or? Almost. <laughs> <laughs> I told him to have it ready for this talk, and I got an email from him at 9.30 this morning saying that it was ready, and here's a slide. Here's <laughs> a slide, but it's too slow. <laughs> Well, the message was a text message saying that he had sent me this email, but I didn't get the email. <laughs> I can check again. I might, might, might have forgotten. Okay, okay. I think that answers um, my question. But I, I want to shake it down first. Um, but that's just for forward mode. Um, but but there's, I think it's straightforward to use the techniques for reverse mode because we were, it was using reflective mechanisms. So, you know, it has access to the source code and can chew on it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, um, that's, can we have Stalingrad? That was oh, absolutely, the absolutely, absolutely. Website. You just type Stalingrad into the web. Yeah, type Stalingrad Siskind or send me email. You, you, it's it's on it's on our web pages. Yes, there's of course a gazillion versions of it, and the most recent. If you want, if you're really going to use it in anger, tell us, and we'll get the most recent version too. And it also has a thousand switches that it takes for things like how far it should expand lists when it's trying to figure out how long they are and stuff like that. Can I assume you didn't write your Fortran pre preprocessor in Fortran and you wrote it in something else? What, what, what did you build that out of? We actually implemented it twice <laughs> once in Haskell and the other time in Scheme. Uh, did you do it twice because one way didn't work? Or um, we did it twice because Alexi Radul, who's an amazingly great hacker, he got his PhD in Sussman's lab. He, he's, he's like a stupendous hacker, was hacking it up in Haskell. And um, after a week or two, Jeff just got so frustrated that he sat down and had like an all-night hack and did it in Scheme. We did, we've just coded up a Fortran parlor in Haskell. So it would be interesting to see alternative sort of implementations. Oh, yes. We, we, yeah. You are certainly welcome to our grammar, although it's only Fortran 77. That's fine. Can you say anything about the F sharp uh, uh, version? I mean, how, how would one use this? Do you need to tag variables? or I mean, what, what? So they have to be available for that reflective mechanism. So, um, you know, it's got that less than dollars business. I think it's less than dollars, right? Sharp angle dollars? No, less than that. Less than at, sorry. 
less than Amazon. So anyway, so and, and then it gives you a parse representation of the source code that, that you can chew on. And so that's how it works. Um, and then it calls back. At some point, you can, there's like an API for calling back in and getting, well, I mean, <laughs> right, there, there's people who are enormously more knowledgeable about this than I. Um, but it, so, it, so af, after the appropriate chewing on the code, then you can um, the, go get it compiled. But is it doing this dual numbers business? Or? Yes. It is. That would be great to take a look at. You have to play with that. Is anything efficient for, you know, a uh, hundred variables in, a hundred variables out, and then the same question for a hundred thousand in, a hundred thousand out? Um, okay, so. Yeah, these these Fortran-based systems. You know, I've been dissing them. They've been working on them for a long time. They do fluid dynamics with them, stuff like that, right? Like one of their big things is they want to get uh, do climate simulations and do sensitivity analysis on that because you want to know like if you dump more CO2, how will that change the climate, right? So I mean, people are very interested in that question. Um, and so the way that's typically done is by numeric differences, essentially, right? <laughs> um, you might question whether that's a good idea, considering like how sensitive that whole system is. So so they. So one of the big um, little subgenres is for doing that. And yeah, they're, th th those systems are capable of doing that kind of thing. I mean, it, it's, it's unpleasant enough that you get to write a paper when you do it, right? Instead of saying, oh, I wrote one line and it did what it's supposed to. Um, but I mean, you get to write a paper because you got your <coughs> code through Tabernacle. Yeah, because you actually successfully did automatic, say, reverse mode automatic differentiation on a climate model. Yeah. I mean, another place this kind of stuff comes up is in power consumption, right? If you want to vary how uh, much precision different variables in your program um, are going to be allocated, because more precision takes more power, um, well, one, well, the way you're supposed to do that is you figure out the sensitivity of the stuff you actually care about to the thing that that you're thinking about you know, how much precision it should have. And if it's not very sensitive, then it doesn't need much precision. So that's, that's another place in, in uh, power sensitive um, computing where you can imagine this kind of thing being you know, like, like sort of behind the scenes optimizing FPGA, you know, who knows what. Do renderers do that? Um, yeah, I don't know. P people have used AD for, for graphics -y kinds of stuff. Um, like just calculating surface normals, for example. Brian, you can tell us that. Yeah, yeah but the, uh, the whole chain for the, your typical big video game has lots of physics simulation and piping into a graphics engine. Yeah. Ultimately, you don't have to compute the how the little particle is jumping up and down if it's not going to be displayed. There are people who show how to differentiate through rendering, but obviously it's tricky. But so I mean, it's just like a max operation. You know, it's, it's just the same sort of cuts as a max operation, but geometric. So, so one thing we've done with this stuff using, um, using a scheme implementation uh, was to do um, computer, um, well, it was actually a student of Jeff Siskins, um, was whose name I forget, to do gra um, computer vision using inverse graphics, like people always talk about, right? So they were like a plain Jane um, renderer, and then you had a model, right, that it's rendering, and then they, they took the image it generates, and they took the difference between that and the thing you're trying to interpret, and then they, they threw it at uh, gradient optimization. And they used all the to differentiate the renderer? Just so. It worked okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, uh, um, yeah, those benchmarky things I was showing. It. Another set of those benchmarks was um, where there was a probabilistic programming language. So, either probabilistic lambda calculus, which is basically like pure scheme but with some source of randomness, and you're thinking of it as representing um, distributions, right? So, and you think of it as all living in one monad or some one probability monad or something like that. Um, or, uh, uh, probabilistic uh, prologue, 
which is where the rules of prolog, instead of saying you just take the first one that matches and then backtrack out of it, instead all the rules that match, um, there's some distribution of which ones you actually go down, right? Because they have numbers, the rules have numbers associated with them. And um, so, so you have these probabilistic programs and they've got some free parameters and you're trying to match some data to them and so you're using gradient methods through an interpreter for an evaluator for that probabilistic programming language. Um, and you can imagine that, that most systems would have pretty horrendous efficiency going through that whole chain. Um, but, but because of the, all the aggressive de-scaffolding and stuff like that, it all gets partially evaluated away and it's pretty fast. So how do AD systems guarantee the numerical stability of the output code? The same way Fortran does. Which is not at all. Just so. <laughs> And I should say, the problem is, um, just as you have to pay attention to numerics, if you're going to AD something, you have to pay attention to the numerics. Um, but, but I'm just writing this function. I, I have no control over what the AD system does. Absolutely. Absolutely. So to give an example of the kinds of pitfalls you can run into, let's say you're trying to approximate some simple function, like sine, right? Let's say computers didn't have hardware for sine. Um, so somebody had just defined it themselves and you didn't even know that, right? And you're just like taking derivative of their code. And the way they defined it is with, say, piecewise polynomials, right? So they had a bunch of polynomials and these polynomials are maybe third order, right? Well then, um, if these polynomials are all third order, then you can be guaranteed that the third derivative will be zero, right? And the third derivative of sine isn't zero, right? It's minus cosine. So um, yeah, the, the, the root issue there is that differentiation and numeric approximation don't commute. And so if you're writing something that approximates some, some numeric function, you should be careful about taking its derivative. Maybe if, if you know its derivative analytically, you should think about that, right? Like somehow hotwire the system. Current systems don't have a way of hotwiring them to tell them that, you know, this thing I wrote here, it's a gamma function, and I know what its derivative is. This is what it is, right? And I, I implemented it this way, but, but, but its derivative analytically is this, and please use that. Don't go diving into the code. So, yeah. AD replaces the floating points with real numbers before doing the differentiation. Right. I mean, that's another thing to do is use exact real arithmetic. But, of course, then you can only define continuous functions, right? And All right, I think it might be a good uh, point to wrap up. It's approaching 12 o'clock. Uh, let's uh, thank Barack for the talk.